Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tang or tied up again in the slavery of the law. Christ has set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get entangled or tied up in the, in the law. Speaking of the Mosaic law and the, the things that Israel participated in that at the time were God and for them, but they pointed to Jesus. And now that Jesus has come, those types and shadows have been fulfilled. Those things had to be taken away. Listen at the Passion Translation. I really like this. The Passion Translation of verse 1. At last we have freedom, for Christ has set us free. We must always cherish this truth and firmly refuse to go back into the bondage of our past. Isn't that powerful? The last time I was at this particular location, I had the privilege of being with you on Easter, and I shared on the empty tomb, on the empty tomb, how that God has raised Jesus from the dead and that tomb is empty, and God raised Jesus from his tomb for us, and now he has raised us from our tombs for him, Amen. for him. And so it's important that we understand that when we get born again, we literally are coming out of a tomb of death and darkness. And that message was burning in my heart so heavy that I wound up ministering a sequel on grave clothes the weekend I was gone. And so I shared on how that when Lazarus was raised from the dead in John chapter 11, verse 44 says that Jesus spoke to Martha and Mary and all their friends or his friends and said, now loose him and let him go. Loose him and let him go. Here's this power this resurrection power that is coming to the body of Lazarus, who had been dead for four days. He was dead so long, the Bible says he was stinking. He wasn't just dead, amen, he was stinking dead. That's dead, dead. And yet here's all this power that raises him from the dead, and yet he still has grave clothes. He's coming out of his tomb of death and darkness, but he needs help. He needs others to help him now and loose him and let him go. We've all come out of a tomb. We've all come out of a grave. We were all born into a tomb, into death, into sins and trespasses. And God has called us out of our tomb. He has raised us out of our tomb. But when you come out of a tomb, you too have grave clothes. And many people have no one to help them get the grave clothes off. And so they wind up becoming tomb dwellers instead of tomb raiders. I got born again in 1965. Yes, young people, there was a 1965. <laughs> and I came out of a tomb of death and darkness and it was real. I was young, but it was very real. And I had a passion for Jesus and a love for Jesus. And I was literally on fire for the Lord but I didn't have anybody to help deal with grave clothes. See, when you get born again, your spirit gets born again, but your mind doesn't get changed, your body doesn't get changed, listen, and all the issues of your life are still waiting on you when you come out of the tomb. And so I had no one to help take the grave clothes off. And unfortunately, from 1965 all the way to 1980, I went back into tombs and was a tomb dweller, hanging out with death and darkness, and I picked up everybody else's grave clothes. And I not only remained in my own grave clothes, I was, I was wrapping myself in the grave clothes of others. And by 1980, I'm embarrassed of what a mess my life was and how bad things really were and how bound I was. Here I'm a child of God, I'm born again. And yet I am bound by any and everything you can probably name to some degree or to some measure. There was no freedom. There was no liberty. 
There was no being a witness. There was, there was none of that. I was walking around like this mummy in the grave clothes, not only of my past, but of all the tomb dwellers I was hanging out with. And in 1980, I get this vision of the cross. I meet Sue, who is now my wife. I'm sorry, I'm not having a senior moment. I'm casting six thoughts down <laughs> that I don't want to get hung up on. How did I meet Sue? And how did she, and how was she involved in the vision? I've got all this recorded in my first book called Identity Theft. But basically, I have this vision of the cross. And in this vision of the cross, I simply see my identity with Christ. And I saw him on the cross, but I saw me literally, I saw me on the cross inside of him. And so I described that and the process of it. But the bottom line is it was like I got born again again. How many of you know you can't get born again again? Amen, amen, amen. I was born again, but bound. And I guarantee you, you know people, you have family, you work with people that are bound by sin and sickness and death and drugs and perversion, just grave clothes that many of them are saved, but they haven't had anybody to loose them and let them go and let them go. And so I had to process what was the difference between 1965 to 1980 and 1980 to now. And there were three things, three things, actually four, but the fourth one involves the other three. But there were three things that happened to me shortly after 1980 that had it happened in 1965, had I had a Martha and a Mary and some friends to help me get my grave clothes off, I could have avoided a lot of pain and a, a lot of things could be said there. We all need somebody, saints. We need each other. Amen. We need our families. We need our spiritual families. You know, in Michigan, we got an affiliate church in Michigan and, and they've got those porcupines up there and it gets so cold up there that the porcupines have to get together for heat. They're needed, but they're also needled. That'll hit the rest of you later. Don't write me on that one. Uh, we need each other no matter how much we needle each other. We need our families no matter how much they needle us at times. And I didn't have either in serving the Lord, in, in following hard after the Lord. We're, we're calling this staying free, staying free, the title of it, but it could be a first class on going from a convert to a disciple. I like to look at Lazarus in John chapter 11. When he came out of the tomb, it was like he was born again, but he needed help to be discipled. He needed those around him to disciple him, to discipline him, to help him get through the things of life. So let me give you, let me give you all three quickly and we're just gonna highlight these. But the church, our church is, is founded in these, these three, I don't even know what to call them, they're so powerful in your life. I don't know how anyone can overcome drugs in this culture. I don't know how they can overcome perversion. I don't know how they can overcome the diseases that are on the horizon that even the church isn't prepared for without these three things. Number one, uh, God's word. And some of you are just gonna, you're just gonna write that off. Well, I know that. Yeah, right, tell me about it. God's word and what it means to be a disciple and to continue in his word. Number two, that without it, you mess up. Number one is God's love, is God's love, God's kind of love. And you're not gonna overcome your past. You're not gonna overcome your mistakes. You're not gonna overcome your hurts. Man, I said a lot right there. 
I, I mean, if you, could, if you could be isolated and, and there'd be no devil, you're going to make a mistake. You're going to fail at something. You're going to fall. You're going to get hurt. Somebody's going to disappoint. Something's going to happen. And if you don't understand God's love, really understand God's love for you, you can't overcome. You can't stay free. And you can't now be a tomb raider instead of a tomb dweller. Tomb raiders go in and rescue people bound by grave clothes. Our church wants to be a tomb raider, not a tomb dweller. And then the third one that's huge, it's just huge, is God's will. And when I say God's will, that throws people. Because it took me a few years. It's hard to believe I, I could go to church as long as I went and never hear anything close to what I'm about to say. And I'm going to say it now in case I run out of time. When I say God's will, I'm not necessarily talking about what you do, what you have, or where you go. If you say God's will to people, the first thing they think is, yeah, what do I do? What, what does God want me to do? What has God told me to do? Yeah, what's God's will? Can I have this? Can I have that? Yeah, what's God's, God's will? Do I go here? Do I go there? Did you get it? You say God's will and the average Christian mind locks into doing having or going and God had to teach me in order to stay free in order to help others get free I have to see God's will in terms of being versus doing going or having because when I see God's will in the light of the cross and the new cre new creation and in the light of being the doing takes care of itself. The having happens naturally. And the going is a lot more fun. Yeah. Amen. And then the fourth one is mind renewal to the first three. <laughs> because if you don't get your mind and have your mind being renewed to the first three, you're going to find yourself in grave clothes. And one of the things that's happening, let's go to, go to John 8, a familiar passage, but I'm going to look at some things we don't always look at. One of the things that's happening in the culture that Christians are getting overwhelmed like a tidal wave at large is deception is deception. It's overwhelming. It's mind-boggling how many born-again, spirit-filled people are deceived in this hour and so easily deceived by the culture. In John chapter 8, this is Jesus speaking to Jews that believed on him. Look at verse 31. And Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, well, I'm in the, the Passion Translation still. Let me go to New King James. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed, who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So a key... And a dominant element of freedom is learning to continue in God's word, to continue in it, to be a disciple of it, and to know it. And once known, it will make you, it will make you free. Man, God's word's amazing. And while I was born again and attended church, I was the only one in my family that attended church. I went to church every time I could go. Anybody picked me up, I'd go. If they had a church bus, every time we'd move to a different spot, man, I'd get picked up. And yet, 
And yet there was not an understanding of the power of God's word in any of those churches. There wasn't an understanding. We're not talking about just the Bible and a book. We're talking about God's word. We're talking about something that's alive and powerful and that it has a supernatural effect on you. In Psalms 107 verse 20, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all their destructions. Wow. He could have sent anything. God could have sent anything. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them. That sounds like freedom to me. From how many of their destructions? All of their destructions. John 17, 17, Jesus is praying his earthly king priest, I call prayer before he goes to the cross. And he's praying to the father and he says, sanctify them through thy, thy word. Thy word is truth. He might've said it different. That sounded funny. I think he said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth, but I don't care how you read it. It says the same thing. Amen. See, think about it for a minute. Sanctify means set apart. We're not set apart as the church by haircuts. Thank you, Jesus. As I scan this crowd, never mind. We're not set apart from the world by attire. Amen. The things that mark us and make us sanctified are different, are not carnal, natural things. He says, God's word literally will set you apart. Just submitting to the word of God will make you different than the people around you. In Ephesians chapter five, Paul talks about the washing of the water of the word to present us a glorious church, a spotless bride to him. God's word washes us. Do you know if you're here and your heart's right, your mind is being supernaturally washed right now from the dirt that it's been exposed to all week? It's supernatural. When I first got started in Durant, it was a small town, still is. That time it was about 12,000 people. And I was just a little different. And I just would quote so many scriptures because I knew people didn't know the Bible and they think I'm making stuff up. And so one of the accusations, when you're in a little town, you can follow the rumor mill on Monday. I mean, Sunday's over, rumor mill kicks up. You'll know by Monday what's being said in the community. And one of the false accusations against me was I was a professional brainwasher. That guy's a brainwasher. I am not a professional brainwasher, but I am here to wash your stinking brains. <laughs> because our brains get defiled. And it's the word and the word only that will wash your mind, wash your soul. It washes you, it cleanses you. It just We need to do a whole series on this. And look at how the word of God has a supernatural effect. Abraham Lincoln said about the Bible, it was the best gift that God gave man. But for it, we could not know good and evil. Right from wrong. Amen. That's a pretty high statement. He knew without the Bible, you could not, everybody say could not, you could not know right from wrong. There's a reason our culture is collapsing. There's a reason why good is being called evil and evil is being called good. It's because people do not know the word of God. They do not know the scriptures, nor do they respect it. Now, here's what's interesting. God works supernaturally with truth. And by truth, guess how Satan works? By lies. This chapter, Jesus declares after they begin to argue with him about being made free, <laughs> they, 
Let me give you a heads up if you ever meet Jesus face to face. Don't argue with him. It's just dumb. And you're going to lose. I'm not being mean to you. I'm just telling you, you're going to lose. So they get to talking about, we're, we're not in bondage to anybody. What are you talking about making us free? We don't need to be made free. Abraham's our father. Man, I'm telling you, the Jesus of the Bible is different than the Jesus even of this culture. Jesus looked at them and said, you're of your father, the devil. If Abraham was your father, you would love me. Amen. And so they're going back and forth. That didn't set good with them either. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to have to go down to verse 41. Verse 40, 41. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we are not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you'd love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. Nothing has changed. If I'm being interviewed on CNN, please do not panic when the interviewer does not understand my speech. Amen. You are of your father, the devil. And the desire of your father, you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. God is marked by truth. Satan is marked by lies. By li That's why you see the lies in the culture being ratcheted up. I know some of you, most of you, almost all of you, probably don't, don't, that's repentance, uh, probably don't want me to, to go anywhere near the culture. But you have to look at the culture to see where it's going and diagnose why it's going there and save your families from what's going on in the culture. If you haven't been awake, this is your wake up call. The lies are getting better and better and more clever and more clever and ratcheted up as we come to the end of this age. And notice that this liar, the father of all lies is a murderer. Man, I could say a lot, but I just want a hug when this is done. I just need a hug. Amen. You got my back, brother. Praise God. It's just amazing at the culture of death and how people not only lie, they love lies. They beg you to lie to them. How could anybody watch certain newscast or broadcast when they lied every day for four years about Russian collusion? Every day, every night lied. Why would anybody after four years believe them? And yet after four years of lying to them every night, tell me more lies. Amen. It's the nature of Satan. It's why people are bound. They, they, it's why Christians get bound. You cannot be bound by a defeated devil unless you believe a lie. Amen. This is why this has to be passionate among at least us leaders. Is I know that if you and I are talking and we're disagreeing, me trying to convince you from my mind is not about an argument or winning an argument. It's about you being free. I don't care about winning an argument. 
I don't care about me being right, you being wrong. That's usually the way it ends up. Oh, come on. I care about you being free. And I know there's only one way a defeated devil can enslave you. It's with a lie. And if you believe a lie, a defeated devil can defeat you. So how do you defeat a defeated devil? With the truth. And I'm not talking about being mean with the truth. I'm not talking about arrogant with the truth. I'm not talking about, I got the truth. And you don't. I'm talking about the truth is what sets us free and keeps us free. And even after we've been made free, if we start believing a lie, we'll be ensnared, we'll be entrapped. And so that, that was number one. Number two is God's love. Go to 1 John 4. Again, you know we could spend hours on each and every one of these, and we will. But I just want to make these simple points. 1 John 4, 17. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he, that's Jesus, is, so are we in this world. How many of you know that can't be talking about our bodies? Our bodies are not like Jesus. You can't go through walls legally. <laughs> like Jesus can. <laughs> Our minds are not like Jesus. Soul, mind, will, emotions. But there's a part of us that's born again. It's our spirit. That part of us is as Jesus is. That part of us is united to Jesus. That part of us is one spirit with Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. What is this fear he's talking about? Now, I believe God's love will cast out all kinds of fear. But the specific fear and context he's talking about is negative judgment. You cannot overcome, dear ones. Your children are not going to be able to overcome your family members are not going to be able to overcome if they, don't un, they, if they don't understand God's unconditional love for them. If somebody would have taught me what I did was wrong, but Jesus paid for that 2,000 years ago, still doesn't condone it, but loves you and he is the one that will help you overcome it, my whole life would have been changed. The reason I drifted even as a young person and then a teenager is, is, is I messed up. And I feared negative judgment. It's sad how we can go to church and not understand the difference between grace and law. And how that God is not cursing us. He's not punishing us. He's not pouring wrath out on us. He's not rejecting us. Does it mean he doesn't care if you do something wrong? It doesn't mean doing something wrong doesn't matter. It means God loves us with a love that's foreign to this world. And to overcome the grave clothes of the past, we got to realize when we mess up, God is not going to turn on us. And yet most Christians don't. We take it for granted around here. That revelation isn't everywhere. Forgiveness is God's love for you. And his forgiveness is past, present, and future tense. Uh, Romans chapter 5, I think it's verse 8, says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more. Now that we're justified... Will we be saved from the wrath that's coming? Wrath will visit this planet again. And that's what we've been saved from. Amen. And so there's no fear of God punishing me. Again, it takes hours. I did two hours of teaching on ch chastening that I don't think anybody's taught on. 
I'm not boasting in that. I'm saying go to the website. Listen to the two hours on the chastening of the Lord. Because God does chasten us. He does discipline us. But he doesn't do it in anger, wrath, or punishment. He does it in love. And there's a difference. And if you don't understand that, you'll make a mistake and you'll self-destruct. There are more people out of church today over guilt and condemnation than any sin you can name. More people have quit because they just feel guilty. They're honest. They're good people. And it's like I said the same thing before I met Sue and she ministered God's love to me. That I'm not going to be a hypocrite if I can't measure up. I'm not going to show up. (laughs) Bye. Okay. I heard a couple of responses. Either I just did a bad, bad job or I went right over your head on that. Man, if I can't measure up perfectly and make no mistakes, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. Then, then, then I'm not, I'm not going to try at all. Well, bye. Okay, a couple more of you caught it. Because I don't care how pure your heart is. I don't care how born again you are to the bone. Billy Graham saved. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Andrew Walmack inspired. You're going to make a mistake. Now, how come I'm so confident? I've done it. And I guarantee you, nobody within the sound of my voice wants to do it right more than me and doesn't want to make a mistake more than me. You might, you might be in the same ballpark, but I want to do it right. I don't want to mess up. I certainly don't want to hurt anybody because sin hurts people. And so when you mess up, the guilt hits you. And if you don't know God's love for you, I promise you, you'll quit. And so that was the second one. All right, the third one is God's will. God's will. And again, when I say God's will, what threw me from 1965 to 1980 was I only perceived God's will in terms of obedience. Obedience in doing, obedience in having, obedience in going. In other words, if you said God's will to me, those three things are gonna dominate my thinking. What is God telling me to do or have or not have or to go? And I self-destructed. Because I guarantee you, after the flesh, there's just not enough to do. And it's going to take you the rest of your life just to find out all the do's. Much less do the do's. And when you get caught in doing the do's, there's so much (laughs) do-do. Boy, that shouldn't have come out like that. (laughs) That it stinks up everything and you just feel like a total failure. That Well, that's not God's will, what I did there. Then you want it. You ever done this? You want, you know what the right thing to do is. You want to do it, but you wind up going and doing the opposite. My mama taught me not to look at her in that tone of voice. (laughs) The ax mama. (laughs) Go to Romans 8. Romans 8. So I had to renew my mind and I got this from the, from the vision in 1980 of the cross that God's will needs to be perceived in terms of being versus doing, going, or having. What do I mean? God's will is that you be a new creation. 
that you become a new creation in Christ. God's will is that you be a child of God. God's will is that you be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. In Matthew chapter five, we have what is commonly known as the be attitudes, not the do attitudes. See, if you, if you put doing, having, or going before being, you're in the flesh or the law and you're gonna, you're gonna mess the whole thing up. And I was good at it. Did you catch that? If you're doing, you're having, or you're going, comes before you're being, you're in the flesh, and self-righteousness, legalism, you, you wind up back under the law and you, you goof everything up. But see, if you understand, I am the righteousness of God. What's God's will? Be the righteousness of God. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Oh my gosh, a revelation and a bathing in that new identity, God's will, changes my doing. Changes my having and my going. Okay? In Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them or those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, time is failing supernaturally on this one. I don't know how anybody can read. Well, I do know how they do it. I'm trying to think of another way to segue into that. That did not say all things are good. And it did not say all things are God. Do you know how many people are struggling in their life because they think everything that happens because God is sovereign, capital, capital S, sovereign, that God's doing this to them. And they'll even read this passage and come out with that. This says that we know that all things work together for good to those who, two qualifications, love God. How many of you love God? Oh, that's the best response I've ever gotten. Now I can't come back with what I was going to say. You disarmed me on that. That's amazing. That many percentage of you love God. To them who love God, number one, and called according to his purpose. How many of you are called according to God's purpose? Now that's a much more impressive hand raised right there, and I don't trust you. Because if I got you individually in a corner and said, okay, tell me what that purpose is, it'll involve doing, having, or going instead of being. Look at the next verse. For whom he did foreknow, for whom he did foreknow, he also predestinated to be conformed into the image of his dear son that he might become the firstborn of many brethren. God's purpose is that you be conformed into the image of Jesus. And he will work everything together for your good to bring Christ out of you if you'll love him and stick to the purpose. Man, I'm preaching better than you're responding. Think about it, let it sink in. Not everything that happens to me is good. Thank God I'm running out of time. Because I mean, I wake up some, some, some days and am I the only, that wake, only one that wakes up and thinks, the devil, I'm talking about the devil, is sitting in the chair. And it's like, he looks at you and goes, Man, I'm glad you're awake. Let's go to work. 
Y'all have never had a day like that? That it just seems like everything went bad? Man, I just want to touch some of you when this is over. And man, working this out in your brain that not everything is God. Because bad things happen to good people. And we don't have all the answers. We got some, but we don't have them all. And sometimes it's hard to discern. Does this have the fingerprints of God on it or the fingerprints of the enemy? It's not always easy. Sometimes it is. But God has promised you and I, if we love him, and I I think everybody raised their hand. And we're called according to his purpose, which he preordained, he foreknew, and he predestinated. What is that purpose? To be conformed into the image of Jesus. That means God will work everything together for our good, and that good is to be like Jesus. That even when we mess up, this is, this is amazing to me. I taught this a little bit when I taught you on David, the weekend of David. How that God can take the ashes of our life and bring beauty out of it. It's just amazing. Of how I can mess up and fess up and the holy fire of God hit that mistake and somehow or another bring good out of it. I'm not saying the mistake was good. Amen. I'm not saying God did any bad thing to me to bring good out. He doesn't have to. I'm saying God is so committed to removing grave clothes for his glory. To taking us from a convert to a disciple. From making us all now tomb raiders not tomb dwellers, that he's made a commitment to you, that my will is simple. Be like Jesus. Allow me to conform you. Allow me to transform you. Allow me to work in everything to bring Jesus out of your life, your heart into your life. I wish I could say, and if somebody ever does say, they're lying. Well, I don't have to be bold like that. But I wish I could say, and if anybody else says, they would be lying that my successes is what's developed me and brought me where I'm at. That'd be a lie. And ma'am, don't you wish it was that way though? Let's just do it right. (laughs) And we'll get to this point when God says, do you know you like I know you? You ain't always going to do it right. So here's the deal. Do you love me? Uh, Yeah, I love you. Will you stick to my purpose? Absolutely. Then I'm going to take a goofball like you and I'm not just going to use your successes. I'm going to use your failures that are more than your successes. And I'm going to bring Jesus out of your life for my glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And you will know it's Jesus because you're such a goof up. And everybody knows you will know it's Jesus. Amen. Amen. See, our brain wants to twist that somehow or another, that God can only use us when we do everything right. I'm not saying let's purposely do things wrong. I'm saying God's bigger than that, amen? Amen. All right, let's close with Romans 12 now and just put it all together. The three elements that involve staying free are God's word, God's love, and God's will. And Romans chapter 12 just puts it all in a capsule for us. I gave you a reference in the note. Please write it down. I haven't heard a lot of teaching on it. To me, it's powerful. Out of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 to 24. It talks about your old man and putting off your old man. You could say your grave clothes. 
put your grave clothes off. And then in verse 24, it says, put your new clothes on, Christ, your new man. And right in the middle is the renewing of the spirit of your mind. The way you take the old off and you put the new on is through the renewing of your mind. Every time your mind is reconstructed, renewed, rewired by the Holy Spirit, a grave clothes, all kinds of grave clothes past just fall off automatically. And the new automatically comes on. So read those passages. In Romans 12 here, verse 1, Paul beseeches us. Well, let's read this. This is pretty cool. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Isn't it interesting that he said, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you do something with your body now. He didn't say, I beseech you by the wrath of God. That if you don't do it, God's going to punish you. No, I beseech you by the mercies of God. Realize your bodies are going to be a problem. That sin dwells in your body. And that you're going to have to sanctify that thing. You're going to have to present it to God on a regular basis. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now let me, let me back up here and throw out a qualifier on something I said. I'm not saying God doesn't have a will in your doing, in your having, and in your going. I'm saying you won't fulfill it if you miss being. God, God does have a will for you on, on what you need to be doing, where you need to be going. But you're never going to find that if you don't understand being. And you're not going to make it ultimately if you don't understand mind renewal. This is so huge what we do to start our week. The word conformed means shaped like, look like, similar to. He's talking to Christians and saying don't look like the world. Don't sound like the world, but be honest. How many Christians do you know that sound just like the world? Be transformed, go through this supernatural changing. And then he says that you might prove, everybody say prove. The word prove means to demonstrate. Demonstrate the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So I don't know what path you're on. I had two paths, 1965 to 1980. I recommend you get off that path. And then I got on a new path in 1980 to date that involves God's word in my life. That if God says it's up, it's up. And I'm not even, amen. I'm not even gonna let the world Talk about how mean God is because he said it's up. Amen. You've got to come to a place, brothers and sisters, that God's word is final authority in your life. Now, we can misunderstand it. We can misinterpret it. We can misapply it. We can goof the whole thing up. I'm, I'm okay with that. But we can't change it. It is forever settled in heaven and in earth. Heaven as we know it or don't know it and earth as we think we know it are going to pass away. But God's word will never pass away. Amen. And there's just a point where you just got to go, okay, I don't care how mean that sounds. I don't care how, and there's nobody in the world that believes it anymore. God says it, it just is. And then love. 
We have to speak the truth in this culture in love for people to grow up, or you could say out of their grave clothes. So we've got to understand God's love, love for us and love through us. I got to quit, but Christians entertain me. They want, they want grace for themselves all the time. But then if somebody does them wrong, they want law. They want everybody to forgive them, but they don't want to forgive anybody. Amen. And then God's will, we, we need to celebrate it every time at the beginning of the service. We're here because of who we are. And a revelation of that is going to change what we do, what we have, and where we go. Anybody get anything today? Yeah. Amen. Amen.